For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, say that out loud, brothers, but you, O man of God, flee these things. We talked about this, the things that we are called to flee. It's a conscious effort. It's a progressive effort. It's continually, which is one, flee the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. Not loving this world, because we know it's perishing. We know when we came in, we had nothing from it. When we leave it, we're taking nothing from it. All we'll take is our faith that we have or don't. But flee the love of money. Practice that, brothers. The second thing we looked at was the lust of the eye. We know the enemy comes in and light or darkness can enter our lives by what we choose, and it is a choice, right? Choose to look at. If we're going to be men of God, the bookends of the chapters of our life have to be faith and love, not love for money and lust of the flesh. Amen? It's, I hope you're doing well. I pray that you're doing well with this. I pray that you're gaining ground with this and that you're seeing the Holy Spirit show up and give you the strength that when you get tempted and that is something we go through, that you jump on the Holy Ghost plane and you run. You take flight, amen? That's what flee means. Get on a plane and get out of Dodge. There is something we've been reading, brothers, on our declaration in the morning that really is a declaration about the victory that we have from every evil attack. Psalms 18, one through six. I want us to read this together out loud like men. The scripture says, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. You, O Lord, are my rock, my fortress, my savior. You, my God, are my rock in whom I find protection. You are my shield, the power that saves me and my place of safety. I call upon you, my Lord, who is worthy of praise, and you saved me from all my enemies. The ropes of death entangled me. Floods of destruction swept over me. The grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death laid a trap in my path. But in my distress, I cried out to you, O Lord. Yes, I prayed to my God for help. You heard me from your sanctuary. My cry to you reached your ears. Hallelujah. Do you believe that, brothers, that we cry out to God when the enemy is crowding us, trying to cause paralysis, that any time we can cry out to our rock, our fortress, him who delivers us from who, whose enemies? All, every one of them, every demon, every temptation, every memory, every condemning voice, when we cry out to God, he hears us and he delivers us. It's never he might hear us, he might deliver us. No, he will. Now, when you pray that in the morning out loud, pray it like you mean it. Declare it by faith. Faith is a big deal. Now, the things that Paul talks about, these attributes, characteristics of God that God has given to you as a son, it's a heritage that you have in Jesus. Things he told us not only to flee, but things he called us to pursue to chase after, but it's not chasing after something that we haven't obtained, it's pursuing revelation of what we've already been given. That's the idea of this holy crusade or holy pursuit that God's called us to. And he talks to us, he's oh, man of God, flee these things, but then he says, pursue righteousness and godliness. We looked at this last week, what the righteousness of God is. It's the big idea of the gospel, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that him, he who knew no sin became sin, that you and I, cockroaches, right, might become the righteousness of God in Christ. It is a gift. So when think about that when you pray that you're coming cloaked in righteousness, not in you, not in what you've done, but what he did, amen? When you start praying this righteousness, you know what follows? Godliness. 
his character, his nature. You start walking and talking and thinking like Jesus. And people are freaked out by it. Why? Because they know the cockroach. Instead, they're seeing Christ. And you go, that's because I'm pursuing his righteousness. <laughs> I'm pursuing the deeper revelation of what the gospel has done and is doing and will do. Godliness is the reflex. It's like the checkup, guys. You cross your knees and they pop on the knee and something moves. It's just a reflex. Godliness in your life is not an act of your humanistic efforts. Godliness, holiness, is a reflex from you receiving the righteousness revelation. Amen? It, it's a gift. It's something you have to keep up with because we got that whole spiritual amnesia. You know, like a kid that says, Dad, and then Dad's upset. Oh, I forgot you said that, Dad. <laughs> or I didn't hear that, Dad. You said mow the lawn. I, I didn't hear that. Clean my room. I didn't hear that. We do that with the truth of God when abiding in Christ. But man, when you're diving in and pursuing, which is what you're doing every morning, when you're reading, it's not you're looking for education, you're looking for re revelation. Do you hear this? You're reading with the idea not, never get tripped up and go, well, I don't, what does that mean? I'm not quite sure, I'm kind of half asleep. Let me tell you what, brothers, you can be listening to the Bible at three o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping and your spirit will be pursuing righteousness. It's amazing. And you know what happens as a result? What? Godliness. His nature flows. And you're blown away. And you're going, man, I'm not sweating being a Christian anymore. It's kind of like cutting a hedge out in the middle of July, the summertime, and just sweating to death. You're working. Some people are doing that in Christianity. They're trying to be godly, and they're putting the cart before the horse without getting the revelation of righteousness, and they're trying to be godly, and they're epically failing and being a hypocrite. That's pharisaical, right? That's not us, amen? We're pursuing righteousness because godly is the overflow. No, those are the two bookends there that the Holy Spirit says, I want for you, child of God, man of God. The next two bookends are faith and love. Faith and love. Now, what good happens outside of faith, brothers? Nothing. <laughs> there is nothing good that happens outside of of faith. And, and faith is not an intellectual persuasion that takes place. No one can come to you and share a Bible verse. I know faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, but lots of people are hearing the bestseller of all time and they still don't have faith, at least not a saving faith. And there is a difference, right? Satan, Lucifer, has faith. It's just not a saving faith. It's not a faith that yields the will. Saving faith yields the will, and it's always beyond what we understand or think. You're with me. So the Apostle Paul saying to young Timothy, this man of God, he says, I want you to pursue faith and love as somehow they're connected intimately, you see. Now see, the Bible says in Revelation, or excuse me, Romans, they're both good books, Romans 12, 3, it says, through grace, through grace, God is allotted to each a measure of faith. Now the context in that passage is about spiritual gifts, but the application is pertinent for our study. The bottom line is that you only believe because God's given you a measure to believe. It's not something that one day you said, I think I'll apply faith here. God gave you the kickstart. You were created in his image, and you're giving it a measure. Now what you do with that measure of faith, whether it turns into saving faith or whether it turns into powerful faith, the bigger question is what is the purpose of faith? The purpose of faith, listen, is to love. See, there are people that will stand before the Lord and say, but Lord, Lord, I had the faith to heal the sick. I had the faith to raise the dead. I had the faith, I never knew you. The faith that I gave you a measure of, it wasn't used to love. It was used to promote you. Just like Satan and his cohorts and demons. They have spiritual gifts and powers and some form of faith in God, but they used it to exalt self versus humble self, which will produce in love. This is what Paul alludes to in his prayer for the Ephesians. And you're gonna, we're going to read this passage real quick here, guys, and you're going to go, wow, faith and love are really these bookends, and they're intimate building blocks for the man of God. Look at this. 
Ephesians, beautiful prayer. Paul, the Apostle Paul says, for this reason I kneel before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in what? Love. Oh, man, here we go. May have power. Power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, long, high, and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, that's a good word, more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And everybody said, amen. amen. It's like you see the apostle Paul, the same guy who wrote to Timothy right into the Ephesians, which Actually, Ephesians was a city that young Timothy was the pastor of. So 1 Timothy is a personal epistle and a note to Timothy as a pastor. This is the letter to the church that he's pastoring. And he's writing and saying, this is my prayer, this is my heart for you, that, you're, that faith would dwell in your hearts. Because the, it, first, if that happens, it's the foundation. Then you're going to know, and this word know is not an intellectual thing. It, it's, it's experiencing the love of God. Like you can say, I believe God, God is love. That doesn't mean you're experiencing his love. When you experience your, his love, his love changes you. His love changes your heart, your mind, your perception, your memory, your hopes, people's perception of who you are. God is manifest in love because God is love, right? But it begins with this thing called faith that the Bible says, child of God, you are giving a measure. Every son of the living God in this place, you've been given a measure of faith. Now the question is what we're doing with it, right? It'd be kind of like if we were all given $10,000 here today. That's why we came, so we can all get a check. Ty, you got those ready? We got those ready. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Question is, what would you do with it, right? Wouldn't it be cool if we all got 10 k today, and we came back a month later and go, what'd you do with it? What'd you do with it? Did you invest it in the kingdom, or did you invest it in you, and your satisfaction and your pride in making your mark in this world? There's that love of money thing, right? How much more important is the gift and measure of faith than money? Your answer is an insight, an x-ray to what kind of man of God you are. The scripture says concerning this topic of faith in Matthew 13, we've read the parable this last couple of weeks. It says that faith produces some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Some of you are going, yeah, for me it might be fivefold. I don't know. Well, if you're here, I'm sure it's not fivefold. But it feels that way sometimes. Where we're trying to apply faith, but we're not seeing the harvest of the things we're applying. Kind of like if I'm just applying faith and reading the word, I'm applying faith and trying to forgive, I'm trying to apply faith in fasting, I'm trying to apply faith in taking steps of faith for greater things. The Bible says that all of us are experiencing different levels of harvest with the faith. Now remember, what is the main motivation behind applying faith? Love, Love right? It's not so I can have my harvest. What's the harvest? The harvest is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is not patience. It's not self-control. There's only one fruit of the Spirit. No, there's nine. No, there's one. And if you walk in the fruit singular of the Spirit love, all those other things in Galatians 6, they just happen. Or is it five? Five, five. You know, they just happen, right? So it's like that's the harvest, the harvest is not, man, if I invest faith, man, I'm going to get that, that Lamborghini that that prosperity heretic, I mean, preacher on TV was telling me about. There's some whack stuff in the church today, guys. Be careful what you watch on YouTube, please. Be careful what some brother or sister comes to you. Oh, you got to listen to this preacher. Be careful. Because most stuff you hear is garbage. 
and it's text out of context, and it's meant to exalt flesh and use Bible verses to do it. Joel Olstein is the epitome of that. Did you say a name? I sure did. Paul did too. Axel Axel, the metal worker, did me a great deal. Of pointed out Judaizers, heretics. We got a lot of heretics today calling themselves believers and having faith, and they are not. God gives us faith not to exalt self or have our best life now. God gives us faith so we can manifest his nature, the fruit of the Spirit, which is, come on, love, agape, this crazy acceptance and humility and passion, and devotion and holiness that is just, it makes no sense. It makes no human sense. The Bible says that, that we're all manifesting different levels of this harvest. Why? What if this morning you could walk away with revelation to go, so that's how I do the hundredfold. That's how I see the hundredfold manifestation of the harvest of the fruit of the Spirit in my life. That's what I'm missing. I pray God would grant that to each and every one of us this morning before we leave this place. Do you think that's a righteous prayer? Amen. Do you believe that to be his will? Yeah. Well, that means if we pray it and we believe it and we know it's his will, what's going to happen? Now that you can name it and claim it. That you can gab and grab. Because you know that brings him glory, right? I, I mean, let's spend time standing on prayers that we know, that we know, that we know are what the Bible teaches versus what we want to use the Bible to say, or do, our debt, right? Now I said to you, what is the difference? Now you guys, I read you the end of the parable that Jesus told concerning the soils. Remember, everyone's given a measure of faith, but it's, it's, it's how the heart posture or the soil receives that that tells us what kind of harvest is going to take place. The faith is not something that you mustered up. It's not something you decide to get. It's a gift. No one can believe without the grace of God. Faith comes through grace. We read that in Paul, Paul's prayer, Ephesians 2, he talks about it. Faith only is manifested because God gives what we can't earn. End of story. Never take pride in your belief. It's a gift. But the question is, your heart posture, the soil of your heart, will dictate what kind of harvest is going to be produced through that gift of faith. That's directly connected with choose this day. Listen to the parable. It says, here... The parable of the sower, Jesus said, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom. Everybody say, word of the kingdom. It's really important. Really important. You might be going, I like that. I just don't know what it means. So that's, that's cool. We'll get there. Word of the kingdom. And does not understand it. It says, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Then he who received the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places or rocky places, this is he who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy. I love Jesus. I love the gospel. I'm a Christian. Man, it's so great to be forgiven for my sins. This is awesome. Yet, yet he has no root in himself, but he endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received the seed among thorns is he who hears the word and cares of this world and the de deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some 100, some 60, some 30. Where are you with your heart soil, right? Know this, God wants to use you as a field for his harvest of the fruit of the Spirit. Man of God, did you hear that? That's, that's God's desire. He created you to bear his image and reflect his nature. Now, you bear his image. You're a triune being, body, soul, and spirit. Now, whether you're manifesting and bearing his nature is directly connected to your heart posture and reception of this gift of measure of faith. Now, the Bible says there are some that, man, if they just come, they don't get it. They even become a mocker. The enemy comes and robs them. Now, you, let's get this chart here. I brought this might be helpful. You guys might want to take a snapshot of this. There's something to ponder upon. 
as this king message of the kingdom that to the human intellect seems reckless, irresponsible, and a form of brainwashing, frankly. The wide path are those that don't understand it, and the enemy is constantly coming to confuse with all types of different philosophies of man and doctrines of demon. This next category, the, rock, the rocky soil, it says there's a group of people that hear the gospel, say they believe the gospel. Now, some, two camps, some say, well, they fall away because they never really believed, right? They weren't really born again. So when the scripture says received it with joy, that can't mean that they were born again because they fall away and you can't lose your salvation. Is that true? Or were they born again and they did lose it? I say, don't make an argument. Don't be rocky soil. What do you think? If you're abiding, it's a mute point. And the devil doesn't get us arguing with each other. Because the truth of it is, there are godly men, theologians, preachers, who have taken solid positions on both of these concerning this rocky soil. I just say, that's not the rocky you want, right? right. All right, so the next one is, the, here we go, the thorns. To see the film among thorns. It says that it's a group of people that receive the gospel, but the love of this world, the deceitfulness of riches. Did we, have we talked about that a little bit? The love of money, Right. The things of this world comes in and it crowds their devotion with the Lord. Once again, whether they went from being a goat to a sheep, back to a goat, or they were always a goat, it doesn't matter. Do not love this world. Do not love God. It is a choice. It's a heart posture of focusing and responding to this grace we've been given to believe beyond what we understand, to receive a love that surpasses knowledge. It's amazing. To me. And this last category, this is my prayer for every one of us, that we would endure until the end and produce this incredible harvest that the scripture is talking about. The question is for us today is what is going to make the difference for you and I to receive the hundredfold harvest of the fruit of the Spirit and manifest his nature in a way that it is undeniable that we are men of God? Did you hear that? What is going to make the difference? Say this word with me, nevertheless. nevertheless. Say it again, nevertheless. You've got to embrace your nevertheless. If you're going to pursue faith that results in a love and a hundredfold harvest of the fruit of the Spirit, you've got to embrace your nevertheless. To embrace your nevertheless means you're going to have to humble yourself. You're going to have to embrace what is unknown, what is uncomfortable, and what is reckless. You can't embrace your nevertheless if you're going to embrace what is comfortable and what you're confident in, and there's no risk. Faith will never grow. And if faith doesn't grow, then the harvest doesn't grow. That's why men of God pursue, like with this Holy Ghost plow. Lord, this is the ground. Plow it up, Lord. Plow it up. When I thought of this, I, I, and this is my prayer, God, what, what is it? Give some insight to us as sons. We need sons to know what does this look like? I can't think of anybody better than the hard-headed foot and mouth, like you and me, Apostle Peter, and his calling. Look with me at this passage. Luke chapter 5. It says, so it was. As the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. If the heart posture is right, faith will be the result. To hear the word of God. It says, he stood at the lake of Gennesaret, which is the lake of what? Galilee. There it is. And saw two boats standing by the lake. By the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. And for those of you who've been here for any amount of time, we've talked about Simon's first name that he had, which means shifting sand. Flaky. You don't want to plant seed on sand. You want to put it on good soil, right? God is in the midst of taking the shifting sand and making some good soil. He's, God's good at that, by the way. He's the best farmer there is. Oh, hallelujah. It says, so... He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. 
When he had stopped speaking, he said to Shifting Sand, launch into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Say it out loud. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Stop there. That's our nevertheless. Now, I want you to think about this. Peter is an experienced fisherman. He's been toiling all night. Now, you got to think, why would a man toil all night? Probably because he's in trouble. Probably can't pay his bills. Remember, God will always allow an empty net before he ever fills it. Because when it gets filled, he wants it to be an object lesson, an opportunity, an invitation for you to have a relationship with him and place your faith in him so that way there's a harvest of love that follows. It's the holy divine setup, no doubt about it. But he's got a battle that's going on in his mind because his body is telling him, don't listen to this call to go deeper, to go cast into the deep. I mean, you've been all night long. Your nets are clean. So not only have you been toiling, that's, that's, that's a word that just makes me tired saying it, toiling. How was work today, honey? Oh, I toiled all day. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's not a great word, right? They've been toiling and they've been washing their nets. And then Jesus comes along and says, hey, get your nets dirty again. Not only... Does that not appeal to the flesh of Peter, but the mind of Peter? Who is this rabbi that's going to come and tell me what to do? He doesn't know what he's talking about. The time to catch fish has passed. This time of the day, it's a waste. It makes zero sense to me in my mind. It's not appealing, and it seems foolish to me. Do you know that is the atmosphere in which faith grows? Faith grows when our belief that we know better than God is confronted with the word of God and we say, nevertheless, I will. That's that money moment. That's that crossroad. When all of a sudden the word of God, that's, remember he says, nevertheless, at your what? Your word. What? You, you want me to offer you the whole first fruits of my whole life? Well, that makes no sense to me. I, I won't have any time for myself, and I won't have any money, and, and, and I won't have any security for the future, and, and I won't have this, and I won't have that. And trust me. Do you want to love God and know how wide? how deep and how high the love of Christ is. Who doesn't want that? Just, just to have that kind of revelation that, Daddy, you love me. I want this tender heart before you where you just, God, I want to know that you adore me. I know I'm a middle-aged guy. I know I'm an older guy, but I still, Dad, I want to sit on your lap. I just want to be held. I just want to be held. I, I want that kind of soft heart for you. Brothers, it doesn't come without faith. A Bible study won't give it to you. Another man can't give it to you. But the sovereign God will allow things to happen in your life where your nets are empty and you're wiped out and you're discouraged. And then the word's going to come along and say, do this. Whatever this is. And that's where you stand. And you have to choose. This is what regulates the heart posture, the soil of your heart for the measure of faith that God has given you. That's the moment, you see. Peter answers it with divine devotion. He's honest when he says, Master, and then he argues with God and tries to make an excuse as to why. Does that sound like you? With the women, we looked at Martha, where she called Jesus Lord, but then tried to tell him what to do to correct her sister Mary. 
Somewhat of a contradiction. Master, you know everything and I don't, but let me tell you what I think that's different than what you're saying. That's okay. He knows anyway, right? He knows. The important thing is that you follow it up with the nevertheless at your word, I will. That's the key. Not that you have doubts, not that you're wrestling, not that you're like, I don't agree, I don't like, I'm afraid, all of the above. That's cool. Be honest with the Lord. He's not going to freak out. He knew you were going to think that before he created you. It's better to be honest, don't you think? Right? Just follow through with, nevertheless, I will, at your word, I'm going to let down the net. It says, and when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. Clean nets to breaking nets. All because of a nevertheless. Wow. It says, so they signaled to the partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Man, this sounds awesome, right? Talk about contrast. Who doesn't want that kind of experience? <laughs> this is good. It says, when Peter saw it, I love this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. There's this humility in Peter now. And he's, he's experiencing the love of Jesus Christ. We know this because of the harvest that follows in Peter's life. He loved the Lord. 1 Peter 1, he talks about this, this joy that's inexpressible beyond words. What's that joy? That's just the overflow of the revelation of the love of God that's manifested because of faith, because he took his nevertheless, and he says, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm willing to be stretched. I'm willing to have the soil of my heart plowed up through an empty net, through fatigue, through discouragement, through betrayal, whatever it is. It's actually all the above, right? All this stuff. I mean, who's going to say the gift of God is an empty net, fatigue, betrayal, disappointment, disillusionment, discouragement? Who's going to say those things are a gift? I am. They're a gift. Because without them, I'll never walk in the nevertheless I will at your word. Because I'll say, I got this. I got this. I can do this on my own. I'll do it my way. Unless God provides the opportunity for me to be humble, I'll never be humble. I'll never apply faith, right? That's, guys, the question for you today is, what is your nevertheless? How is God providing this perfect storm of atmosphere so he can come into your life and he can give you this monumental crossroad moment that radically changes your life to this hundredfold blessing? I pray that you, as you watch this video clip we're about to play, that you would be inspired to pursue faith that results in love. Let's watch this together. Simon, it's been a month since you have visited Ima. You know how it's been work and I know I haven't been a good... Please, please listen to me. I haven't been honest with you. What do you mean? I've been fishing on Shabbat because I've had no choice. Andrew has text texts. I've got text texts. We haven't been able to keep up. I did some things I'm not proud of to fix it, and now it's gone bad. And we're in trouble. We? What do you mean? I, I'm in trouble. But we, because I need a miracle, or I can be in big trouble. Not... We could lose the house. What? If I don't catch a ton of fish, or get some help somehow, they'll arrest me. Yeah, so I need to go Go now. where? The fish, I gotta spend the rest of the week doing nothing but catch every fish I can, and hope I can fix this somehow. But no more talking. Maybe God can get your attention now. Stomach. 
Andrew? James and John, I presume. And who brought the old man? I heard you need a real fisherman. Well, uh, there are only so many hours in the night, huh? Let's fish. Zeb! Come around! Sometimes the sea bests all of us. It's not your night. Simon! It's him! Excuse me. No time for this, Andrew. It's him! Simon! It's the man! John said he's here! Right now! May I ask a favor? I'm teaching these people, and apparently they're having trouble hearing me. If I could stand on your boat, that would be helpful. They're having trouble hearing you, huh? Yes, yes, of course. Please, please, stand on our boat. Thank you. I need to go. I'm sorry. No time for this today. Stay a few moments longer. I have something for you. For me? Uh, I'm in a hurry? Yes, I know. Just allow me a few moments. I'm Jesus. Thanks for this. Simon. In my last moments with you, I want to share another story. Because I'm on this boat, my final parable should be about fishing, yes? Simon, please send me that net. This net gathers fish, all kinds of fish, yes? Yes. All kinds of fish. And the kingdom of heaven is like what happens next. After the net is full, Simon and the others draw it to the shore, sit down, and sort out the fish. The good fish go into the barrels, the bad fish thrown away. So it will be at the end of the age. Angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into a fiery furnace. Do you understand? These parables I tell make sense to some, not to others. Be patient. That is all for today. I have some business to attend to with my new friend. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. Uh, I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. That's your word. Push it, 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 push it,
I told you. I told you. I told you. The boat, it's guilty. Get out. Get out. Get out. My brother and the baptizer. <laughs> you are the Lamb of God, yes? I am. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. You don't know who I am and the things I've done. Don't be afraid, Simon. I'm sorry. We, we've waited for you for so long. We believe. But my faith, I'm sorry. <laughs> Lift up your head, fisherman. <laughs> what do you want from me? Anything you ask, I will do. Follow me. of Peter's nevertheless I will let you word God used this fisherman to preach a sermon at Pentecost where 3,000 souls went from hell to heaven they could walk up to the gate beautiful and just call someone to stand up your heel just you can see you can hear I mean it wasn't Peter it was God inside Peter, and that just happened because he took this moment that God set him up for. Like, like, would that ever happen to Peter if God didn't set him up? He, he set him up, and there's before this moment happens, brother, I, I want you to know what you will experience is fear. You will experience fear because the enemy is gonna do everything he can to cause paralysis in your life where you won't cast into the deep. It's a battle that's going on. Super Bowl rings, they don't come through a bubble gun machine. It's sacrifice, it's pain, it's sweat. It's facing fears. If you wanna be in the spiritual Super Bowl, if you wanna be a man of God that walks in mountain-moving faith that results in a Holy Ghost, fruit of the Spirit harvest, you gotta come to that moment and say, I, I, I'm not gonna shrink back. I believe that Peter and all these brothers were facing all types of trials prior to this nevertheless moment. To finish the rest of the passage, what took place after this, it says, Peter and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish, which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, say it out loud, brothers, they forsook all and followed him. Wow. Don't be afraid. Trust me. I got news for you. God's called us as men to trust him together. Do you hear that? Brothers, we're in this boat together together. We're not called to be an island in the boat by ourselves. We're supposed to be in the boat with Jesus and together, learning how to deal with our fear and walk by faith together. Last night, it was roughly three o'clock in the morning. 
I woke up with a nightmare that God allowed me to have. You might say, that doesn't make sense. Well, it will. It didn't to me at first either. I woke up and said, that was just from the enemy because I woke up half asleep praying because I just felt so attacked and so paralyzed. And my wife goes, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, oh, I just had a really bad nightmare. And it just, oh, and she's, she's praying over me. And I got about probably three hours sleep last night. It was a heck of a night. I, I, I woke up thinking about this nightmare and, and the Lord spoke to me through it. And I believed it was for us today, that it was a dream. And I wrote down some thoughts and I'm gonna share them with you about what the dream was and what it meant to me. I think it's for us today. In this dream, I was sitting asleep on a couch in a room with an unknown number of brothers in Christ. As I sat on the couch sleeping, I dreamed that demon came and stood to my right on the couch that I sat on. And at that moment, I was filled with a spirit of fear. And then I woke from the dream on the couch and the demon was now standing in the form of a man saying nothing, oppressing me with the fear and causing paralysis. I turned a flashlight from my telephone on and shined on him, but I still could not see his face, nor did he move when I shined the light on him. Then I pulled a gun and I pointed it at him. And once again, he did not move. Then I woke the brother sitting next to me and I alerted him to my battle and I pointed at the demon and at that moment the fear vanished and I awoke from my dream. And as I got up this morning praying through this, I'm like, Lord, this is the fears that, that I face of taking steps of faith and conquering. You've called me not to do this alone. That the answer is not me operating as a solo agent or a lone ranger, if you would, but I need to include my brother, whoever I, my brother is next to me, and say, mix your faith with mine, and let's point towards what we have to conquer. And it was like at that moment, the fear was gone. I believe that is so true, the way God brings two or three together to bring a judgment of whether something is of light or darkness, and that we need each other. But so often we don't. We just think we can be in the boat alone. I've got Jesus. I don't need anybody else. That's not God's design. We are the body of Christ. Iron sharpens iron, so we shall sharpen one another. That takes humility. That takes risk. That takes vulnerability. That is part of your nevertheless. You, me, we cannot do it alone. We need Jesus, the head, and we need his body. And all around you in this room, my brothers, you've got forever family in this place. Imperfect as we are, God is so ordained. We need him, and saying we need each other is the same thing. In Jesus' name.